lecture by Mark Abel, the 2011 award recipient of the College of Engineering Alumni Society American Award for CSE. Let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. If you were at lunch, I'm going to repeat what some of the things I said at lunch, but um, uh, uh, Mark uh, has been at Intel for 20 years, and uh, in his time at Intel, his teams have won or shared the highest honor that Intel bestows on its uh, engineers, the Intel Achievement Award, seven times over. Yeah. Which is, is that the record? Uh, close. Yeah. 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 Um, for the creation of new technologies and new businesses for Intel, including the invention and delivery of technologies that have shipped in over a billion PCs. A billion PCs. Might be closer to two billion now, actually. Yeah. Like I don't billions know. And billions, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Before joining Intel, Mark held research and leadership positions with Bell Labs, Xerox Park, U.S. West Advanced Technologies, and Siemens. He has also co-authored over 20 journal conference publications, including several papers that are highly cited in the computer-supported cooperative work literature. Uh, Mark received his. Uh, BSE degree in electrical engineering uh, from the University of Michigan, summa cum laude in 1979. Now, <clears throat> the reason we love Mark is because he has been <laughs> Intel's executive sponsor of the University of Michigan since the 1990s uh, and has been an active sponsor and advisor to the university, to the College of Engineering, to EECS, and to many of us professors and students in this department. He has served the university community uh, as an early and ongoing member of the EECS Alumni Association board, as an advisor to several successful New York startups, including Arbor Networks, as a member of the Full Information Advisory Board, and also as a member of the College of Engineering Advisory Committee. So Mark is one of us. We love Mark, and I uh, <laughs> like you to give him a big round of applause. He's going to tell us today about stories from the high tech career of an accidental engineer. Mark? Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm just so honored and thrilled to be here. I, uh, uh, and, I, and actually, I was thinking about this. Uh, I think we are all incredibly fortunate uh, to have, for those of, you, those of you who have gray hair like me, uh, been in the industry for a while, uh, seen the changes that we've helped create over the last you know, 25, 30 years. Uh, and it's just accelerated in the last 10 or 15. And my, my son Mike here, who's a, uh, and I was talking about Hul during lunch, uh, these guys are sort of just the beginning of their careers. I think the next 20 or 30 years are going to be even more amazing. And I think we are all blessed and lucky. And, and I've been lucky, and I'm going to tell you about some of that luck today. Uh, but uh, what a great time to be alive. So, all right. So, uh, this is kind of what we're going to talk about. And this is a fun talk. You know, I usually get up and do technical talks and all that. This is kind of some of the fun stuff that's happened over the years. And I just want to kind of tell you about, first I want to tell you my accidental engineering story. And uh, some of you have heard it before. I apologize for those of you who've heard this story before. And uh, then I, I really broke my talk into three parts. I just want to talk, tell you some of the stories of leadership that I've come across over the years, some of the lessons from that, send some individual career uh, stories and lessons, and then a little bit about, little bit about life. And uh, and hope that you have fun while we're while we're doing this together. And I, by the way, I'm real interruptible. If I say something you think is stupid, just say, "Hey, Mark," you know. So, you know, raise your hands, whatever. So, uh, so I assume you folks recognize this picture. Uh, that big building in the back there. It's on Central Campus. It's the Denison uh, Physics and Astronomy Building, and uh, that is the building that when George Haddad was was chair, and I was in the uh, it, you know one of the students in that department. Um, that was called East Engine, and the building across the street you can't see, it's kind of behind your back, is West Engine. They're now called East Hall and West Hall, and everything's moved to North Campus. So I came into Michigan, I was a cocky uh, physics and math and computer kid, uh, but really physics and math major. And uh, my first year, I was in LSNA, I know, sorry. Uh, and, uh, and I was studying physics, and I took, I had tested all of physics in high school, and I'd taken sort of some you know, the first sets of classes. And my first, beginning of my sophomore year, 
I was taking the first real serious physics courses, upper division courses, um, and I got the first problem set in one of those courses. And uh, I, was look, I looked at this problem set and I started doing it. It was deep math. I mean, it was math. It was a math assignment. It was just, you know, th uh, all these proofs and, you know, all this stuff. And, and it was taking hours and hours and hours to do, like, one problem. And I said, God, this stuff, you know, why do all this stuff, you know? And so, so I went in, like any good student, I went and talked to the professor. I don't, you know, I don't remember the professor's name, to be honest with you. <laughs> but I, you know, could be. But <laughs> we'll have to compare notes. Uh, but I went and talked to the professor. I said, Professor, this is, by the way, this is before the drop ad date, you know, the beginning of the semester, right? I said, Professor, this, oh, this mathematics, you know, this is really a math assignment. And, you know, I'm here to learn physics and, you know, I'm and really excited about it and, you know, all that. And we got into this conversation, and, and we started talking about it. And eventually, it got more animated and louder, and, uh, and our voices started you know, going like this. And, and I, could, I can sort of picture now all the people in this, you know, up in that Denison building, up one of those floors there, all these quiet physicists working away, you know, sticking their head out the door, wondering all this yelling and screaming is down the hall. right? And so eventually, this professor turns to me, and he says, you know what? He insulted me in what, for him, was probably the supreme insult. He said, you know what, if you think like that, if you believe that, you really ought to go down to the you know, bottom floor of this building, walk across that courtyard over to one of those engineering buildings, go become a damn engineer. <laughs> so I slammed my book down, and I said, I'm going to do just exactly that. And I went down to the floor, and I went across the courtyard to East Engine. I walked in, and that day, I transferred to en the engine school. And I'll tell you something, best decision of my life. Well, second best. My wife is right here. It's the second best decision. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you, um, what an what a, what a, what a, uh, incredibly good decision. What a lucky, fortunate thing. Because, like I said a few minutes ago, can't imagine having done more, you know, something <clears throat> excuse me, more fun and interesting than the last you know, 30 years. So with that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about leadership. So I have a question for you folks. So it, in the... Um, in a lot of leadership courses I've taken, and I imagine Steve and you know, other people in the audience, Farnham, uh, they ask me this question, what, what leaders do you most admire and why? Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys that question. I, I don't care if it's political leaders, I don't care if it's football coaches, business leaders, you know. So let me, somebody raise your hand and tell me who, a leader you admire. Okay, Bo, all right, me too. Okay, somebody else. John, who, what leader do you? Okay, all right. Oh, it's one of those kids who sits in the back of this. You know, I love to do that professor. That's great. I love it. Uh, Farnham, tell me somebody you, a leader you admire. Of any, dis, any ilk. Bill Clinton. I actually agree with you. I think Clinton and, and uh, Reagan have been the two most successful presidents of my very different kind of presidents, but I agree with you. The leadership. Yeah, John. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Okay, a good one. Okay. Others. One of the students. Come on, some, some stu You must have a leader you admire. No Mahatma Gandhi's, no, I mean. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Okay. No, that's a good one. Come on, some student. Anybody. All right. So, I'll give you my answer. Okay. So, my answer to this question, it was in a business setting, okay? And the answer I gave was my dad and two Intel people I've worked with, okay? One is Craig Kinney, who was the Intel VP who hired me and ran Intel's labs, and the other was Andy Grove. And I almost put um, a Bob Kahn, you know, the, uh, the guy, along with Vince Cerf, won the, uh, uh, the Turing Award for the internet uh, work that they did on this list as well. So let me tell you why. Okay, so first, my dad. My dad was incredibly calm in the face of difficult things. You know, things happen in a family, you see life and death things happen, financial things, and that always impressed me a great deal. Also, he was a man of very high integrity, and he had an incredible network of friends who helped him get things done. And it turns out, if you look at surveys about leadership, all of those things tend to be on that list somewhere, right? Craig Kinney, I'll, tell you, I'll talk a lot more about in a little bit, but Craig helped change the face of the computing industry, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. You probably don't know about Craig, but I'll tell you about that. And Dr. Grove, 
Um, Andy, as probably you folks know, he was the CEO of Intel for a long time and one of the founders of Intel. And uh, so I was talking to Andy a while ago, and, uh, and I, he was, I, this was shortly after he was Times Man of the Year. I think it was 97, so it was probably late 90s. And I said to Andy, I said, oh, Andy, I had a one-on-one -on -one with him. I said, no, I really admire you. And of course, people blow smoke at Andy all the time, right? And he said, you know, Andy said, I don't, those of you who know Andy, you know, he's this really tough guy. You know, he's like, why? Why do you, you know, he says, okay. So I said, well, I said, well, when I got to Intel in the early 90s, uh, we were just, you know, uh, kind of in about the same place as a bunch of our competitors, right? And, uh, and what you did was you drove the 386 to 486 transition in an extraordinary way that, that made Intel into the company it became in the 90s and 2000s and, you know, made us the biggest semiconductor company in the world. And he bet the company on being able to transition us from the 386 generation to the 486, and he did it in about six weeks. And I thought it was the most one of the most extraordinary examples of leadership I'd ever seen. He bet the company, took huge risks. He got manufacturing, sales, partners, you know, everything shifted in a very short amount of time. And after I got done telling him why, he said, good answer. <laughs> so, so anyway, I'll talk more about leadership. But you think about what you know, makes leader, you know, in your head, what's, what leadership matters. And it can be leadership in any domain, like I said. You know, the dean of engineering, you know, whatever it is. Right? OK. So a buddy of mine and I were talking about this years ago, and we were talking specifically about some things that happened at Intel and some leaders there, about people who were being successful and not successful. And, uh, and he said, Mark, a leader has to have a clue and have a plan. And, and I said, well, what do you mean by that, Mike? And we talked about it a bit. Um, and essentially, it's understanding the situation, knowing what you want to do, and then having a plan to get there. Right? When Farnham went and did Urban Networks, you know, he, had what, he had an idea of what he wanted to accomplish. Not only did that, but he, had, he put a plan in place to go do that. Now, I want to ask you to think about, um, so how many of you, you in, are most of you in here football fans from University of Michigan? OK. So I want you to think about U of M football coaches, where you would put football coaches. So let's take mm, Rich Rodriguez. No. <laughs> so where would Rich Rod fit on, the, on Mike's little two-by-two you know, people in the industry love these things. Where would Rich Rod fit on this, this plan, no plan, clue, no clue? The red. The red. No, I, okay, so I disagree. I think Rich Rod had a plan. Bottom right, yes. I think, I think he's right here. So, so he had a plan, but he had no flipping clue. Okay, he did not understand the University of Michigan. He didn't understand Ohio State, Michigan. He didn't understand, you know, Michigan State, Michigan. He didn't understand the Big Ten. He got all these little guys who got knocked four yards off the line of scrimmage when the big guys from Wisconsin showed up, right? Um, you know, Bo Schembechler, on the other hand, somebody said you admired Bo, right? Bo had a got here, and he, had, he understood this place. He had a plan, and he went and executed, okay? I think Brady, I'm hoping the Brady Hoke's up in that green spot up there, okay? But in any event, and you put this on any domain, uh, presidents, right? And I'm not going to ask any political affiliations. Where does Obama fit in your head on this chart, right? Where, where did Clinton fit? Where did Reagan fit? Okay, and I'll leave that hanging out there and just let you. Yes. Interesting with uh, Rodriguez and maybe with Obama is the context in which they came in. So I actually would disagree with you. I think uh, Rodriguez had a clue and he had a plan, but he also was in an environment that made it very difficult for him to succeed. Okay. So he might not have had the clue of all the things you talked about. So I, I think. Fair enough. He, 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 That's true. That's true. It's very contextually based, situational, uh, situationally based. I agree with that. Um, but I also, I also respectfully disagree. I, I think Rich Rod. So I think there's a third dimension about how well your clue and your plan fit in. OK, well, we'll talk more about that. I, there's actually about three or four other dimensions we'll talk about in a minute. So, but, but anyway, OK, well, thanks, John. All right, so, um, so what does it mean to have a clue and how do I get one? Um, it's learning what you need to learn, knowing what you need to know, uh, and then it's figuring out what you, want to, what, what you want to make happen. And I think, again, about Farnham and his company. I mean, he decided what he wanted to make happen. Uh, he, he had all the technical knowledge. He didn't have the business knowledge when he started, but he gained that stuff. You learn, you learn things as you go. So the plan is how you get there. And there's something very important, and it's, it's actually partly to John's point. And I want you to read this sentence very carefully. Um, execution and focus trump intent. And this is something I've learned over and over and over again. That is that <clears throat> you can have all the good intentions in the world, 
right? And I think Obama's maybe fitting into this space, perhaps. That you can have all the good intentions. You want to go make the world a better place. You want to go deliver a winning football team. You want whatever you want to do. But maybe you, you can't, you know, you have trouble actually executing and delivering on it. And, uh, and, and in particular, I see people, particularly entrepreneurs um, and people who are starting new things, where you get very focused. And focus is incredibly important. A number of you have done companies. I know a lot of you have done companies in the room. You get very focused on what you want to do and how you want to make it happen. And getting real, you know, that's the most important thing. And um, I have a number of role models here. I, I actually, I want to tell a story about <clears throat> from my time at Xerox Park. Now, for those of you who are old enough to remember, there's a book out called Fumbling the Future, which is about how Xerox Park, how Xerox had all the, the, the golden, you know, the golden eggs there and, and didn't figure out how to take advantage of them uh, in, in the 80s. And I went to work at Park in the 80s. And right after, shortly after that Steve Jobs from, from Apple had come in and taken a bunch of the folks uh, away from Park and a lot of the technology that became uh, the, the Lisa and then the Macintosh. And really, you know, helped change the face of computing, you know, for the masses. Um, so Jobs repeatedly has done this throughout his career, did this throughout his career. Sorry, he's gone, but uh, did this throughout his career. Um, and so I saw that, it, you know, shortly after I got to Park, I saw sort of the, the out the outgrowth of that. Do you guys know who Jim Clark is? SGI. Yeah, he's the founder of SGI. What else has Jim Clark founded? Netscape. Netscape. That's right. So Jim Clark was my architecture professor at Stanford, and uh, computer architecture. And uh, at that time, Jim um, worked about 100 hours a week, and about five of them were for Stanford uh, teaching and whatever, right? The other 95, he was building the graphics engine, designing and building the graphics engine. And he was um, starting his company, basically. And I, saw, I mean, I just, I, it was amazing watching this guy, because he was just, I mean, every, every lecture he was talking about his graphics engineer was, you know, he was focused, man. This guy was focused. Uh, so, and of course, he's a, what a, a multi-billionaire now. So. And Dr. Grove, I'll talk more about in a bit, but, uh, but a number of great examples of that. OK, so another key to the plan, you know, getting this plan together, and it's again, again to some of the stuff John said, is your team. So I wanted to ask you guys, so take a look at this picture. I want to know if people, who, now, and people over the age of 50, you can't answer this question, OK? <laughs> so who are these guys? Anybody know? Grove. Yeah, OK, which one's Grove? <coughs> the, yeah, that's, and, that's Andy right there with the mustache. <laughs> Very good. Well, OK, the old guys know this. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, George, George, with all due respect, I don't think you're under 50. <laughs> so. So talk about a team. So Andy Grove, you know, Times Man of the Year, one of the great you know, business leaders of you know, any time. Bob Noyce, Bob Noyce. So, so George, what did Bob Noyce do? So he started Fairchild. He started Intel. These are the three founders of Intel. And, and what else did he do? He's dead. He's dead, that's true. <laughs> no, he was also, with, along with Kilby, the co, the, he, was the co, he was the co innovator, uh, co inventor of the integrated circuit. So you talk about Gordon Moore, that's Moore's Law, right, and Dr. Grove. These three guys, I mean, talk about going to war with a team, you know, and, and all the people that wanted to come work with these folks, you know, that's, that's part of the way you build a team. All right, anybody know who this guy is? I kind of mentioned him earlier, although I didn't mention him by name. All right, this is Larry Tesler. And Larry was the guy that was the key guy that Steve Jobs took out of Xerox Park uh, to go to go build the, uh, uh, what became the Lisa and the Macintosh. And he became a chief scientist at Apple eventually. And, uh, <clears throat> and no, again, go know what you want, you know, the people you need to get to go do something going and doing it. Now, you guys probably don't know this guy. Um, but this guy may be the best programmer the world's ever seen, or certainly of his generation. Uh, this is Peter Deutsch. And uh, Peter was the best, best programmer, hands down, at Xerox Park. And uh, he wrote, a bunch of the Interlisp stuff. He did the first, all the virtual machines for, for small talk. And I worked with him in the small talk group. And uh, Peter was such a good hacker that everyone at Park wanted him on their project. Okay? And there's a story about Peter. So what people would do is, so you got a picture. Peter's office, he had this nice corner office that overlooked the Bay Area up in the building at Xerox Park. And everyone wanted him on their project. So what would they do? Well, They'd wander by, so they, they would conspire a little bit, and they'd say, okay, we've got to get Peter working on this thing. How do we do this, right? And they'd wander by near Peter's office when the door was open, 
and they'd start talking, and they'd say, you know, I don't think anybody could write the code to do this. This is like the hardest problem to solve. God, this is really, you know, interesting stuff, but boy, I don't think anybody could do, you know. And eventually, Peter would like stick his head out there, what are you guys talking about, you know? And eventually, he'd get engaged in the conversation. Oh, by the way, they would often do this kind of on like a Friday afternoon, okay? And so, this impossible hunk of software that no one could write, that's, you know, whatever. So they'd go away, you know, Peter kind of be thinking, you know, they'd come in Monday morning, and it was running. You know, the code was running. And Deutsch, is, he's, still, he's still out there, he's doing music stuff now. He's, he ended up becoming like a fellow at, at, uh, at Sun. He was uh, the chief scientist of Park Place Systems, which was the commercialization of small talk company. He's a great guy. So again, go find the right people. And then finally, you guys probably know this guy. This is Tony Fidel. And this is the guy that, that's, you know, our Michigan buddy who, uh, you know, Steve Jobs went out and got. So, he, you know, so he, he'd, he'd had a best-known method, going and getting Tesla and his gang, right? He did the same thing with Tony. And, uh, you know, go get Tony to go do the iPod and, and go do that business. So one thing, more thing I want to mention here, this really is very applicable to your life in a whole bunch of dimensions. You know, it's, it's about not only finding the right folks, whether it's Farnham trying to build this company, but it's also what teams do you want to join? What, you know, when you're interviewing for a job, do I want to be part of this gang? You know, do I want to be, you know, I want to be part of the faculty at the University of Michigan, computer science or whatever, right? Um, so there's a pretty good life lesson here about, you know, finding the folks you want to work with and going after it. Okay, so another piece of this lesson, change will happen, plan for it. And I, there, I have so many stories about this, but, um, you know, Grove is incredible uh, when you read the second quote there. This is exactly how he managed the company, you know. You make decisions, you run with it, you don't have all the data, but, and then, whoops, I screwed up, and you switch 20 degrees to the left, and Farnham, I'm sure, I don't know how many different, you know, switches you guys did in the first, you know, 10, <laughs> but switches, you know, but that's typical. The typical startup delivers the third, fourth, fifth product that they really start, you know, seriously working on, right? Um, now, I want to tell you a personal story from this year. Uh, there's a pretty good chance I might not have been standing here, I might, at least not on Intel's nickel uh, this year. I, I, uh, <laughs> I own a, um, a part of our corporate uh, bonus target this year. I own a project that if, you know, the, will get measured and, and determines the bonus for everybody across the company, including the CEO. So they track, I'm, you know, with a microscope, whatever you want to call it, this project. And um, so we started it kind of early in the year, and it was supposed to deliver September, October, kind of time frame, and in fact, next week, we're going gold with this thing, so it's, a good, it's got a good outcome. Um, but, and, and what we had to do was we partnered with a number of other companies outside, but we had certain key partners, and last August, so this stuff's supposed to deliver September, October. Early August, uh, I get a call. Uh, it's from my, the VP at the partner company, and he says, hi, Mark. I said, hey, what's up? And he goes, well, um, I'm not working for XYZ company anymore. I said, really? He said, yeah, they reorganized, and I was uh, moved out uh, today. I said, oh. And he said, but don't worry. The project will be OK. You know, everybody's saying good things about it. Well, so a couple days later, the person who replaced him gives me a call and says, hi, Mark. I said, what's up? They said, well, you know that project we were doing together? Uh, we aren't doing it anymore. I said, oh, OK, thank you very much. So that's the bad news. The good news is we had two other uh, partnerships that were kind of in, I call them the back burner that we were working on at a low level. And so we cranked those up like crazy and put all the resources we'd had on this one project, on this other thing, and we're able to recover and, and it looks like we're going to deliver, uh, you know, this month and next month. And, uh, and, you know, but literally, I mean, I would have been in deep yogurt and so would my whole team. We probably would have gotten blown up. Uh, you know, corporate world's tough out there. And so, you know, have a backup plan. So, all right, one more, one more Andy Grove story, Andy Grove and Gordon Moore story. So, uh, this is, so if you hear people around Intel, if you're, any of you work there, you hear this discussion about revolving, the revolving door exercise. Uh, so the story is, in the early 80s, and some of you, again, those of you who are old enough will remember, uh, the Japanese were killing us. They, you know, in the semiconductor industry, Intel and all the other DRAM manufacturers who weren't ja the Japanese folks were, were getting we're getting drilled. Um, and uh, there was a real discussion. You know, at the time, Intel was a DRAM company. So Andy Grove and Gordon Moore were sitting there thinking, God, how, what are we going to do about this? You know, this is, it, by that time, Bob Noyce had passed away, and Andy and, and Gordon were running the company. 
So uh, this is a quote from Andy's, from Andy's book. And th the notion here was, you know, he basically said, hey, you know, if they brought in somebody new, they fired us and brought in somebody new, what would they do? And, you know, Gordon immediately answered to him, hey, we'd get out of the memory business. So Andy said, well, why don't we walk out the front door and come back like we're new and do the right thing and do it? And they did. And, in fact, changed the course because they focused all the resources on microprocessors and, you know, turned out pretty good, pretty well for, uh, for Intel. But, but we use this all the time. And it's actually a very powerful tool to be able to say, you know, whether it's John Laird's research program and something's happened, he's trying to rethink it, you know, or Farnham's company or, or you know, whatever it is, you know, your PhD thesis, if some of you are PhD students, hey, it's kind of not working, you know, what do we do? What's the right thing to do for right now? That's a very powerful thing to just get rid of the, the chaff and just look at the wheat. So, all right. Um, the other thing is, you know, you don't just sit around and wait for things to change. You want to try and change, change the way the world is anyway. This was the Xerox Park motto. Um, and although Park, you know, didn't follow it on the business side, they certainly did on the technical side. So, uh, um, so you know, change the game. How do you change the game? And I'm going to give you two examples of things that, happen, that I've seen that really help change the game. So uh, can somebody talk, does anybody out there, got any marketing type, anybody know what Intel Inside is? That mean anything to you, all the little stickers that show up on all the PCs, uh, you know, all the co-branding, you know, when you, when you go play the, uh, you know, all, all the ads on TV, you see a Lenovo ad and it's got an Intel and all that. Well, so back, picture yourself back in about 1989, 1990, First of all, a couple things. One was the PC was a toy, right? And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Technically, it was uh, not great. And also, Intel, despite no matter what Intel did making the chips better, the, the system the, that it sat in, the personal computer, was you know, really a, uh, uh, you know, was, had architectural problems. But in addition, people didn't know that Intel was inside, OK? So, they, so these guys created what's probably the most successful branding campaign, uh, you know, I'm uh, sorry, most successful ingredient branding campaign in the history of U.S. business, created Intel Inside. And Dennis Carter uh, and Andy put this together. So the other side of this was, so that's the marketing side. But on the technical side, they had to deliver on the promises of Intel Inside. And uh, a guy named Craig Kinney, uh, you know, was a computer architect uh, and VP at Intel. He ran Intel's labs. And uh, he decided, he and Grove decided together, you know what? We're going to go fix the personal computer architecture. You know, they, I mean, there's no reason why the buses have to be broken and it doesn't do networking very well, that it, you know, that it can't display, the display system, subsystem's broken, that, you know, it doesn't handle media well, can't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So they went and did all of this work to create, uh, and I was in this organization. I was hired as the networking and communications guy. And so I went and... Um, and myself and a guy named Jawad Kaki at Microsoft, we fixed networking in the PC. And by the time the mid-90s got there, and all of a sudden everybody was interested in the Internet, the PC was a full-fledged client on the Internet. And uh, this was a couple of those Intel Achievement Awards for, for, for this stuff. And it turned out, you know, I don't know if you go, go look at, you know, the number of PCs that sold and all that. So just a question. How many of you, is, how many of you gone on the Internet with a personal computer, an IB, an Intel architecture PC? Show of hands. Okay, so if you have done that, you've run code, my team wrote, you know, exercised the hardware that, you know, we figured out how to put in there and all that. So to me, this is one of those, wow, this was just incredible. You know, I, I was a research guy before I came to Intel, right? And I published papers and five other people would read them and I think this was great. Here, we were impacting how billions of people used computing every day. And to me, this was a real thrill. Okay, so this was, you know, one of the great, you know, five or seven year periods of my career, and it was awesome stuff, and it made Intel a pile of money. So, all right, so some career lessons. So uh, this whole thing about having a clue and a plan and being able to execute and all that sort of stuff applies to your career, too. You know, it applies to thinking about what you want to do with your life, what you enjoy doing. I mean, being in this field, you have more opportunities than, you know, it's incredible, right? So Mike and Rahul and all, all the rest of you guys, you know, thinking about what you want to do and going after it. It's good stuff. So, um, have some fun as you do this stuff, right? I mean, figure out what things you like to do and go focus on them. And that's, that's what I've really done in my career, especially working in research labs. Man, I had, I've had a blast. Been able to work on, you know, whatever I thought was an important problem, have impact. Uh, and this is a quote from one of my, one of my bosses, uh, my U.S. West manager, and she was a Stanford PhD, awesome lady. And, uh, 
uh, but focusing on what you want to do and, and again, going after it. Um, understand the business. So I got a question for you folks. Uh, so how many of you can read a corporate balance sheet? Farnham, I know you can. Okay, Mike, you took some business classes. All right. So I find that to be incredibly useful in so many domains. You know, understanding what, how what you do, uh, you know, how what you do, you know, impacts the bottom line of a company. And it impacts your own bottom line. It impacts the bottom line of a department, you know, whatever it is. I got a question for you. They asked this question, what does Intel make? They asked this question of us when we step into certain classes at Intel. So I have, so what does Intel make? Somebody tell me. Semiconductors. That's a good answer, yeah. Sorry? Money, that's a good answer. Makes dreams come true, okay. Other answers. Microprocessors, yeah. Okay, the answer that, that the Intel finance people tell you is money. And in fact, it's a good answer. It's all good answers, but, but the understanding, you know, how that money gets made, you know, what it means, what's, you know, what's cost of goods sold and, and, you know, all that corporate balance sheet stuff, uh, how you contribute to the bottom. You know, I run an R&D organization. I'm a, I'm a cost center, okay? We're a cost center. And knowing, you know, how, how that cost center, you know, I, every day I have to justify, you know, what we do. And of course, we're trying to build some little businesses too, but, but most, you know, mostly I'm a cost center. And cost centers you know, are targets and when times get bad and all that, so understanding all that. Okay, um, this is so obvious, I, I don't even know if I want to talk about this. I've done two overseas assignments, you know, I've managed people, you know, managed groups across the world, and I, you know, it's just so obvious today. But when I went overseas first time in the 80s, uh, it wasn't quite as obvious. You know, in fact, people thought, why are you going overseas? You know, what, you know, because the hot technology stuff was going on in the United States. So this one, this is so obvious, like I said. Oh, yeah, good things happen to those who deliver. Remember the execution thing? Um, I had a boss used to say, it was a business guy used to say, good things happen to those who, who, who hit their numbers, you know, hit their financial numbers, right? Um, so I can't tell you how many different times in my career, um, you know, in bad times, my group has been spared you know, issues and things because my teams were known to, known to deliver good stuff at the right moments. Uh, and I think, you know, again, this is pretty obvious, but a lot of people don't realize how executing and being, have a reputation, reputation to be able, that you're really delivering uh, you know, will, uh, you know, will help you. So, oh, people and relationships matter a lot. So, you know, Mike and I have talked about this quite a bit, but uh, so in the last 25 years, the years, you know, I've had uh, probably 15 jobs. And all 15 of those jobs since early in my career have come about from people who knew me, who I knew, I was referred to. I just, so we have a lot of faculty room. I would bet half the faculty in this room, without even knowing, got their position at Michigan because they knew somebody on the faculty here already, or they had worked with somebody, or they'd seen the, the research, or they'd been at a conference together, they had a reputation, whatever. All of that, you know, you know, the rest of your, your life, you know, do great uh, and what you're doing, Khalil's nodding his head. You wanna, you wanna tell me a story? You got a story for that? It's just, just yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, and I mean, sure, there's other methods these days, right? I mean, you know, there's social networking and there's all kinds of other stuff, but you know, this one's pretty straightforward and obvious, so. All right, so, a few life lessons. Uh, and then I'll take some questions after a foil or two. So um, having a clue and a plan applies to, you know, to your basic life, too. My wife, Diane, and I decided years ago we want to live in Portland, Oregon, which is a you know, real nice place, but it's not the high-tech mecca of the universe. And, uh, and I worked pretty hard to get to Portland, and then it turns out I was there, we were there a few years. My job went away. We moved away. I somehow... Uh, uh, finagled a job back there again, but I knew it was temporary. Uh, and I eventually found a job at Intel, and that great job that I've, you know, that I've had for a number of years, and going and re refarbing the PC industry uh, with, with, with Craig Kinney. And, you know, because we, we had a pretty strong goal in mind. We had a clue what we wanted, we knew what we wanted, and we put a plan in place to go get it. And it doesn't always work out, and you have to adjust, and you have to adapt. You know, Farnham's off living in D.C. now. You know, I, he probably didn't predict that, you know, five years ago. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, this, this applies to your life as well. Um, striving for balance. Well, uh, you know, we work really hard in this industry, right? Being able to, you know, know that you're going to uh, keep your health good, you know, all that sort of stuff. 
Uh, you know, I, I run every day, as a lot of you know, know me. And giving back for me is a real important thing, you know, working on the things at Michigan, you know, uh, uh, doing things in our community and all that. So it's pretty straightforward for me. So takeaways from today. So this is my last foil, last uh, one. So having a clue and having a plan, I think, works for your, your, your basic, you know, your organization, your work, your life, and your career. And, and also the execution, be able to, you know, deliver on things, go make things happen, um, dealing with change. Um, which teams do you want to be part of? Who do you want to be part of your team? Uh, understanding the business and what your bottom line is. What is it, did you deliver that adds value? You know, whether it's re your research, your students, or you know, something in the business world. Um, having fun, focus on what you want to do. Uh, the people and relationships things. And then striving for balance. And with that, I'll be quiet and I'm happy to talk about any stories or answer any questions that uh, you know, are not obscene. And, you know, so. Okay. So, so now's the fun part. I want you to ask me some hard questions. Yeah. The tension between focus and balance, especially for undergrads. Uh, focus and balance, yeah. I see so many uh, students that uh, really know precisely what it is that they want, and they couldn't be more wrong. How do you, uh, <laughs> how, how should undergraduates really view this, uh, this balance? So between, between, um, Um, well, the cool thing is that whole thing about adapting, because I think it's perfectly terrific for a student or anybody to go off and try something and go down a path. And, and then sometimes you find, oops, uh, you know, it wasn't exactly right, exactly where I was going, or you find, or you discover, or maybe, it, you know, but you learn some stuff along the way. So we should encourage them to uh, pursue headlong. Uh, um, and in fact... My, my son's sitting right here, and I've told him exactly that, you know, that I, I usually, my standard answer to this is, if, if by the time, you know, you should be experimenting in your 20s, and if you haven't figured it, something, you know, some path out by the time you hit about 30, if you're still sitting on a beach gazing at your navel or whatever it is you're doing, you know, when you hit 30, you know, but, I, but of course, the way the world's changing, I think you have to do this through your whole life. You have to go through that adapting thing. But I think, yeah, I think, you know, if, if you want to be a musician, um, oh, and, and also, always have a backup plan. Right, so if you're gonna if you're gonna go be a musician, uh, you better have something behind you because a lot of people want to be musicians, whatever. So, I don't know if that's the answer you wanted, but you know. That's like... Oh, come on! I, I have some questions for me, Farno. Oh, that's an interesting question. Did you have a specific thing in mind, or you just want to? Um, so how have I seen it evolve? Um, the leadership under Paul <clears throat> is very different than under his predecessors. The folks before Paul were, Paul Adelini is our current CEO. Uh, they're just practicing the thing outside there. Oh, that's the, that's the uh, space thing out there, right. Um, so, so Paul is much more of a business person by training. And... Um, and Craig and uh, Craig Barrett and, and uh, Andy and his predecessors were all like PhDs in engineering, and um, and I think that you know decision making at Intel is much more business, even more than it used to be, even more business focused than it used to be. I think that's one key thing. Um, I think that you know the world has just changed. You know, if you want, you listen to the press. We're in the post PC era and all that good stuff, right? which I don't fully believe, by the way. I think, we're, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting things still to do in that space. But I think you know, we, we did not you know, hit on all cylinders when it came to our comp competing in the mobile space. And so I think that, that Intel, you know, while, while it turns out that on a, mo on a money basis, Intel's making more money in the, in the mobile market today than almost anybody because we build all the back-end servers you know, for everybody. You know, as you know, this, the, uh, you know, Intel's the biggest company in the world in data center stuff. We, you know, we have 90 plus percent of the, the data center market for our parts and all that. But anyway, so I think that Intel has changed, you know, in that respect. We're moving more into, I would say, software and services businesses, which is part of where I sit. We're trying to, you know, I'm always in the new space. I'm always, I, as, as Kevin Kahn used to say, I never get the t-shirt, right? Because if we finally succeed, you know, I've already moved on before we make money in that space, right? But, uh, but trying to move to software and services, uh, I think software has just become, you know, incredibly more important to Intel. 
Um, and I think we're, just, we're a bigger company than we used to be. Uh, you know, we're more diverse. You know, and, and the other thing is that, um, you know how uh, Apple was sort of viewed as a personality cult around Steve Jobs? Um, Intel used to be a personality cult around Andy Grove. And, you know, uh, as one person said it, uh, our, our CEO no longer speaks with a Hungarian accent. Uh, in other words, you know, it's no longer Dr. Grove. And uh, so I think, you know, you have to move on from, you know, anytime you follow a tremendously charismatic leader, you know, that's, that's a pretty dramatic change. Because Grove used to say, let's go take that hill and turn the company that way. And I mean, the company went like this. Somebody likened us to a school of fish. You know, a school of fish can do a turn like that. Uh, you know, it, it just feels more diverse and more different that way. Does that answer your question? Yeah, Khalil. Sure. Uh, no, no, so, you know, notice the mainframe business didn't go away, right? I mean, I think it evolved some. I think that, uh, you know, the, the tablet world and, the, and what's currently the laptop and PC world, you know, will, will mesh in certain interesting ways. Um, you know, the server, you know, all the back-end data center, the data center business, if you think about, look at the data center business, you know, for every few hundred devices, my iPhone's in there, but, but every few hundred iPhones that sell, there's a server somewhere that has to be sold. That data center business is just exploding. And I, do you see that going, slowing down anytime soon? I mean, I don't. I think that's going to grow for, you know, the next five years anyway, and I can't see beyond then, but probably next decade, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, every era is different. Um, you know, the, the Bob Noyce era, you know, of doing semiconductor companies is different than, than today. I mean, I, I think not exactly like that one, but I, but I could see Intel reinventing itself. Uh, we do all the time, of course. You know, I mean, maybe not in as dramatic a fashion. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, and that's the other question that we have such an incredible core business. You know, we, we're selling parts at 60 plus percent margin. I don't think there's any other semiconductor company in the world that's get, that on the volume, well, first of all, no one has the volume we do, but, but on the volumes that we sell, no offense to Qualcomm, Mikey. Mike my, my works for Qualcomm. So. Uh, but, <clears throat> but um, you know, I don't, I don't see, I mean, we have an unbelievable core business. So I think, you know, we got a lot of opportunities to jump off from that. We have a lot of time to go, look, I, you know, um, you know, the, mobile, the parts that go into mobile phones and stuff are really, are really pretty, uh, they're not very high margin and they're not, you know, uh, they, they don't make much money on those parts. Now, the, the exception to that is that Qualcomm has a good IP, IP portfolio, so everybody has to pay Qualcomm an IP license even if they don't use their parts. But, uh, but I, you know, I don't know. It's interesting times. Uh, what do you, you have further comments or? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, next week. <laughs> hey, next week, the week after that, I'm done, man. That's, no, I'm just kidding. Steve, yeah. So uh, you spend a lot of time thinking about it in the future. What are a few, two or three insights you could share with us that you think might happen in five, ten years <sighs> so, so you know, uh, first there's an old saying that goes that engineers dramatically underestimate or overestimate what they can get done in a year and dramatically overestimate what they, I'm sorry, dramatically overestimate what they've done in a year and underestimate what they can do in five years, okay? Um, think about five and 10 years ago, say 10 years ago, right? Uh, a lot of things that are happening, Facebook didn't exist, right? Um, I don't know is my answer. I mean, if, if uh, you know, if I've thought about, you know, stepping back, where do the MIPS go? I think the MIPS are all gonna go as they've been starting to, to human interface. You know, that <clears throat> the way people are going to interfacing with machines. You know, so understanding speech, um, understanding, you know, like, like on the new uh, Apple iPhone. Um, sorry? Siri, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Siri stuff, yeah. Um, uh, you know, but, but a lot of the myths being applied to how humans interface. I, you know, there are people playing around with, like, the brain implant thing so that, you, so that you're, you can more directly interface with technology. Scary stuff, but I think, you know, there will be some things that will emerge out of that. Um, I think the intersection of biology and, and, and computing, I think those are the two fields. You know, I talked about how great it is to be alive and all that. 
I think these are the two fields that are most interesting things are happening. And, you know, I don't know how all that's going to come out. But those are the spaces that come to my head. But, but you know, none of us have a clue, you know, in real life. So, yeah. Dave. <laughs> because so uh so there's a very simple answer to that question uh, <laughs> it's called it's called it's called the legacy and uh, and the reason that Intel is where it is is because there's so many pieces of software out there that run on Intel, run best on Intel, and have been honed for Intel, that you know, changing, changing that would, would eliminate our, our, one of our core advantages. Uh, so, and you know, eventually, I mean, yes, all, all architectural franchises and all that go away eventually. I mean, you know, this one's been, been running for you know, almost 30 years. And uh, you know, as long as we can keep it going, that's a great thing. Um, but I, that's just, you know, that's why. I mean, it's, it's to our advantage to, it's not to our advantage to go do that financially and so forth. Okay, we're almost done. Any other? Yeah, yeah. I, I saw another hand or two, but that was, yeah, admin. Can you uh, say something about the role that you think fundamental research can play inside industry? Or is it dead? Like the oh, no. Industry? Okay, so the kind of research, thanks, Khalil. Um, the kind of research that that we do, um, well, okay. You know, I, I wish, I wish that you know we could go back to the days of Xerox Park and T.J. Watson and and Bell Labs, Bell Labs Murray Hill, because uh, those were those were incredible days. I think that that um, you know Bell Labs was supported by a monopoly, that the gov basically government supported monopoly, right? Um, Watson was supported by a, essentially a monopoly in the computer industry for IBM, right? And Park was, you know, kind of this funny little side project that the Xerox, uh, you know, copier monopoly, if you will, or copier, you know, dollars paid for that they got very little out of. Um, so going to, you know, companies like us, we do very focused research that's for us, and we go try to take advantage. The reason, the reason I'm here at Michigan all the time is trying to take advantage of the, guy, the wonderful stuff you guys do. But I think, I think the world's changed. And I, you know, I wish that weren't the case, but, but I, you know, I love those days. Uh, and there's certain places where we do fundamental research. Like we, we have these incredible fab facilities. We try what I think is really pretty fundamental chemical, physical kinds of research stuff with some of our partners to go figure out the next processes, you know, next generation processes, some pretty deep manufacturing stuff. But it's going to be real focused like that, like on things. Um, and real inflection point research out there, you know, uh, we, we, we participate, you know, by by working with academics, but I think you're going to see it less. Someone else disagrees. Somebody disagrees. Say so. I'm, you know, happy to argue. But all right, maybe one more question, and then I think we're done. Any other questions? If not, I think on behalf of everybody, I want to thank that. I'm going to find that physics professor. <laughs> <laughs> Except yeah, we will, uh, thank you. Uh, let's give Mark a huge round of applause. Thank you.